Hello, good evening everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the manager of the European Reference Network called Eurogen, which is for patients with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. It's known as Eurogen. Um, one of the uh, main aims of the Reference Network is to deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with rare urogenital diseases. So we have many activities and one of those is virtual consultations. So using a web-based platform, we can exchange information on particular patients. We also produce training and education material and we have an exchange programme for trainees to move between different healthcare providers. We're also developing a registry, so that's an exciting development coming up in the future. Uh, so this evening's webinar is one of a series of webinars uh, that we've produced in collaboration with another ERN, Ernica, also EUPSA and the patient organisation SOMA. The topic of this webinar is hydroclonic sonography and self-management in patients with incontinence, tools to facilitate better bowel management. Um, and that's a unique feature of one of, of the reference networks, the fact that we're able to bring together highly specialised experts in a particular field together with the patient representatives. So we're really delighted uh, to this, this evening we have here with us. We've got Stephanie Marhauser, uh, a paediatric surgeon from Charité University Medicine Berlin, and she's head of paediatric colorectal surgery and she specializes in surgical therapy and aftercare uh, for patients with anorectal malformations and Hirschsprungs. And then following Stephanie, we have Annette Lemmy, who's the co-chairwoman of SOMA, and that's the German patient organization for patients with arms and Hirschsprungs. Uh, so without further ado, ladies, thank you both so, so much for sharing your expertise with us all this evening. And I will hand over to Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle, for your kind introduction. So um, uh, we already had a seminar on bowel management some weeks ago and during the discussion there were many questions about the um, the preparation of the bowel management and whether it wasn't possible to use sonography instead of radiation and that was sort of the uh, start of this webinar and um, because we want to um, introduce to you our method of in uh, of bowel management in patients um, and that's what I want to present. I have no conflict of interest. First of, first of all, a, a, a few words about propedeutics. Uh, what is fecal continence? That's a, a major question if you're concerned with incontinence problems. If you're a continent person, you can feel the urge, you can differentiate between air and land, and you can either withhold or choose the best moment for a voluntary defecation. Um, patients with anorectal malformations do um, face a difficulty here because many aspects of uh, perfect continence don't apply to them. Um, I show you here the spectrum of anorectal malformations. There might be a minimal variance as this one with a perineal opening or on the other hand, cloaca, cloacal malformation, which certainly uh, presents a complex um, malformation. The frequency of incontinence um, is like a step ladder. We introduced this step ladder concept some years ago to explain to parents where we they would stand with their child, whether sometimes parents are very worried Although the child in our eyes only has a simple malformation like rectoperineal fistula, while in um, parents might be totally relaxed and not see the complex 
um, problem of a rectal vesicle fistula. That's how we designed the step letter concept for parents. And what we learned is that the more complex the malformation, the more frequent are continence problems. Treatment independent assessment has been done in Germany for um, many years. Um, we have a network called, um, Euro, uh, called CureNet, and here we um, measured the continence uh, of uh, patients from very many different uh, hospitals. And what we learned here is that there is still, although there should, should we would expect the um, simple variants of anorectal malformations not to face many continence problems. Reality is different. Even with a simple variant, very many patients are not continent without bowel management or help. Um, with Hirschsprung's disease, we also face problems with continence. And uh, here we have two different groups. We have on the one hand, patients with Hirschsprung's disease that uh, um, have more or less a constipation, but there are also points where children uh, after Hirschsprung's disease correction have incontinence problems. And I think we have to be honest here, children with repeat correction, major complications, surgical mistakes, or a total aganglionosis may be incontinent. It's not the outcome we want to have, but if you're honest, it's an outcome that may occur. So um, the Crickenberg continence score has been agreed to be a good um, measurement for, for continence, although I want to um, point at a, one critical aspect. Um, if you look at gr group two, soiling grade two, and it says daily no social problems. If you're working with patients that are daily soiling and they have no social problems, then they certainly uh, have a neglect for their continence problems. So I'm a bit skeptical of the continence score, but still we use it because it's widely uh, known and uh, has been agreed to. Um, indications for irrigation, so for, for a more complex uh, bowel management concept, we do see in the fecal incontinence group, um, grade, group two, grade one, two, and three. Grade one is something that is discussable with the patient and with the needs of the patient. Conti constipation may also be an indication for irrigation if the patient is constantly concerned with his, con uh, with his continence. So, um, what we are trying to plan for each and every patient is an individual ther uh, therapy that um, is con uh, con combined from different steps. We start with the first investigation in our ambulance, in our, um, at our hospital. Then we have a home visit by a specialized bowel management nurse who is focusing on the special um, situation in the home of the family. And after that is finished and we've, um, we've got enough information, we uh, invite the patient <clears throat> for an inpatient treatment and um, we try to find the variable treatment components that are, are useful for this individual patient. Um, at the pediat pediatric surgical evaluation, first of all, we do need a a good clinical history, physical examination, and the older the patient is, the more com uh, complicated it might be to get an exact classification of the underlying malformation. You do have to look for associated defects. As you see here, many patients face um, spinal problems, tethered cord might have been overseen. We have a lot of urological um, side effects and don't forget the genital problems that many girls are facing while, while they come into puberty. And, uh, on the, and we also have many children that have problems with their limbs. So we do have to look at all different aspects of the body. Um, 
Then we review all surgical product protocols and x-rays and we ask the patients to fill a two-week defecation protocol to get insight into the actual situation. Um, before we start our treatment, um, we do an intestinal purgation, which really means children have to drink large amounts of uh, macrogol because this seems to be the best preparation for our hydrocolonic sonography. I'll explain that in a minute, what really that is. And then after we've done the hydrocolonic sonography, we develop the bowel management program for the patient. We try to design an individually tailored enema for this patient, and we try to do this within a very short time, which is one day. Um, with sonography, you can evaluate the colonic motility. You can really measure the volume of the individual enema the patient needs. You can talk about anal hygiene, physiotherapy, and you can start um, to control your efforts. You will um, do a defecation protocol. So what is hydrocolonic sonography? It's a method we um, have started to work with some 15 years ago. And um, we use um, an electric pump, which is connected with a Foley catheter. The Foley catheter is given to the child so that he can try uh, the, the catheter with his hand uh, and see that it's not, um, not dangerous, that it's not hurting. Then we introduce the catheter transanally into the rectum, we block the catheter, we put a bit of glibber gl jelly onto the chi uh, child's tummy, and then we start to do the enema, why the volume of the, uh, why, uh, we start to the infusion installation of the water, and why we do that, we control the liquid with ultrasound. And after you've done this kind of intestinal purgation, this orthographic cleaning of the bowel, you can really see whether you've been successful. And what you see here, this is the cecum. And now you can say, okay, we've filled the whole colon from the anus rectum sigmoid um, through the uh, other parts of the colon until you've filled the cecum, and now with this enema, you can try to be as effective as an undergrad colonic enema that would be given, for example, over a Malone stoma. So one more picture just to show you that you can really see the motility of the bowel and you can follow the movement. So what we do like about sonography, um, the water sonography is it's really no radiation. It's a standardized procedure. Um, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes of your time, but it's one investigation. And after this one investigation, you will definitely know the definite volume for this individual person. And you can also see the colonic motility. And if there is, for example, a little motility, you can, um, on the one hand, predict how long the duration of your washout will be, but you can also try to predict how many pauses between the um, washouts you can, um, you can make. So some patients would not need an enema uh, uh, washout every day, but they might need it every second or third day. Uh, what are the different systems you can use for transanal irrigation? You probably all know the peristine system, a very useful and nice system. Uh, we've started a lot with uh, Navina Smart in these days, especially in the older kids, and uh, uh, they are just uh, at the moment uh, children that are not naive uh, about anorectal irrigation are trying to compare the two systems, and we will learn from them which one they prefer. In some cases, this sh a small system uh, from Kufora can be helpful, or in special situations, you may start with a very simple variant of washout. We are trying to find the perfect catheter for every child. Those are the ones from the peristine system. 
but there might also be special challenges and that's especially in Hirschsprung kids because in Hirschsprung kids the outlips of obstruction may be an obstacle to a successful washout so what we do we um, start the washout with a Foley catheter that we place in the anus of the child we blow up the balloon and then we would instillate the water and instead of making the child um, let out the water by itself we first try to overcome the outlet obstruction by using the catheter as a kind of drainage it's also important to find the perfect toilet for a stool evacuation and um, looking at all these brilliant toilets in the end i personally like this toilet very much from the vietnamese boy um, uh, the variant on the left side with um, the water to shower the uh, the anal anal region after uh, the washout is also very attractive in, in Germany. Even uh, the insurance company might pay for it if your child, um, if you apply it for it for your child. So to be successful, it needs explanation for sure, cooperation of the child, and then a defecation. And we all prefer that the ch children should defecate in a sitting position on a toilet or a potty. And I try to explain to the kids that they should think of a water slide and that the water slide, this is uh, one of our kids going down the water slide and it's being washed out like the stool should be washed out by our irrigation. Uh, there are also other components that um, attribute to a good outcome. And we talked about the enema itself but regular routine is also a very important milestone. Children have to apply to a regular routine for their washouts. It might not be a daily routine, but it should be on special days and always the same days of the week. So don't alter the days. Don't do it on a Monday and next week you do your uh, transanal irrigation uh, on a different day. So we uh, propose to the parents sort of a timetable that would be like doing the washout Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, and then the next week again, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, although Sunday and Monday would be one and the other day. But if you uh, come uh, explain this to the patients, they're usually quite prepared to do that because it's a lot easier also with your regular life. You can introduce, integrate, the washout much better into your daily routine if you don't have to think about uh, which day I'm going to do it. Um, what we also uh, consider a very important strategic aspect is that we want children to be independent as soon as possible. And that's one other aspect we're going to talk about later. Um, another uh, beneficial aspect is um, if you um, introduce probiotics for the patients, um, it really helps to stabilize the, uh, the um, bacteria in the colon and especially in Hirschsprung Hers kids, it seems to be beneficial and uh, help against um, enterocolitis. Just to give you a few, a few results and not only talk about patients, I want to show you one of our studies. We included 360, 46 uh, patients. The age group was from 4 to 18. And um, we had all the different types of malformations. And there were also 65 Hirschsprung kits in the study. Um, this is the continent score with treatment after six and 12 months. And what you can see is that most of the patients really um, soiled very little, one to uh, two times per week. But we also had a large group that did not soil at all with our bowel management concept. And if you have a patient who soils one or two times per week, you certainly have to work and uh, try to become better. So our take home message for today 
do try hydrosonography. We consider it a really helpful, easy technical support to determine the volume needed for the affected colonic washout for this one individual patient that you are facing. And um, if you take these 10 to 20 minutes, it is really well tolerated. The children um, don't, are not afraid of it. We never saw, it, saw any significant complications and it's really effective because you've done your, your washout and preparations within one day. You don't have to hospitalize children for a week or even longer. Um, we consider a, a very important aspect that colonic irrigation should not be done uh, all by itself, but it should be combined with these individualized self-management management strategies, because if you do this, adherence to therapy will improve and children will learn to be um, self-reliant at an early age. So if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them and I would really um, welcome a lively discussion after the next presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, good, e good evening to everybody. I hope you can see my screen. Um, many, th many thanks for giving me the opportunity to present SOMA and our self-management seminars. In these seminars, children from the age of nine years learn to do bowel management on their own. SOMA is the German patient organization for anorectal malformations and Hirschsprung's disease. We have 1,200 members, two-thirds are parents, and one-third are adults who have one of the conditions themselves. Here on this slide, you can see two leaflets with our motto, no longer at alone, advice and help for more quality of life. As patient representatives and EPECs, we are active in two European reference networks in Eurogen for anorectal malformations and in Ernica for Hirschsprung's disease. Here you can see the diseases we cover. In our opinion, the sentence in blue letters at the bottom of the slide, lifelong consequences despite operation is very important. And as already Stefanie Merzweiser stated, despite the corrective operation, a lot of patients have to deal with lifelong symptoms like incontinence and constipation. In order to sufficiently empty the bowel and or to achieve a social continence, they have to do regular enemas. Of course, during the first years, the parents are doing this follow-up care with their children. But as the children get older, it is more and more important that they become independent from their parents and learn to do enemas on their own. And this is the reason why we are offering our self-management seminars, which I would like to present to you now in detail. We started our seminars already 15 years ago in 2006. I think this photo is from one of our first seminars. It shows Stefanie Merzhäuser with her daughter, who often accompanied her mother during the first years. The seminars take place twice a year, once in Münster in the middle of Germany, once in the south in Nuremberg. So far, more than 150 participants um, shared these seminars. They take place in a youth hostel over four days, and we limit the group size to six children with one parent's parent each. The project is organized and led by SOMA, in cooperation with a pediatric surgeon, a nurse who is familiar with follow-up care, a medical supply company, and me as project manager and representative of our patient organization. This slide gives you an overview of what takes place during the four days. Parents and children learn about the malformation and get to know various medical devices. 
It is looked at the individual medical history. There is the individual private training. We offer fun free time group activities and the participants meet other children and young adults with ARM and ADHD. Now about the program in detail. Children and parents get a child-oriented presentation about their diagnosis and treatment. On this slide, you can see Stefanie Merzeus again, and on the second photo, there is, there is Sabine Grassoff Der, the pediatric surgeon who accompanies our seminars in the south of Germany. The pediatric surgeon also always talks one to one to each of the parents about their child's medical history, identifies potential gaps in the follow-up care and makes recommendations for improvement. And often it, is, it turns out that parents aren't aware of all the relevant details of their child's diagnosis and oper operative treatment. Children with anorectal malformations as well as children with Hirschsprung disease take part in the seminars, but there are differences between both diseases. Also, various medical devices are explained and presented. On this and the next slides, you can see that this is not only done theoretically, but the children can touch everything and assemble the medical devices. As you can see, they have fun trying things out. And becoming familiar with the medical devices reduces fear of the bowel management process. After all these explanations, the main purpose of the seminar starts. The pediatric surgeon and the nurse visit each child in their room and instruct and help them to do an enema on their own. It is very important to meet the children at their individual stage of development. Some already know how to do parts of the process, like assembling the medical devices, for example. Others are still completely dependent on their parents' support. The expectation of the seminar is not for the children to become completely independent during the course, but to give them individual advice on their way to self-management and independency. In order to respect and protect each child's privacy, the process of practicing the animas happens in their private rooms at the youth hostel. This offer is not just about the practical process, but also about self-confidence and encouraging the children to take care of their own body. The children and the parents also benefit greatly from meeting two young adults with anorectal malformations or Hirschsprung disease who accompany the seminar and the group activity program. They talk about their experiences, how they manage their lives with the malformations, and they answer the children's questions. This often gives a lot of hope to the parents because they see that their child can have a good quality of life. And the children have the possibility to talk to young adults who have been through similar experiences. In addition, what is also always important for the children, we offer an attractive free time group program. They go sailing, visit a zoo or other interesting places. These activities are done together with the nurse and the young adults, but not with the parents. This way, parents can practice allowing their children to move towards independence. What are the goals and results of our seminars? Children and parents gain a better understanding of the malformation and accept animals as part of their life. Another goal is finding individual solutions in the animal process for more efficiency. For example, often the process can be managed in less time. Also important is the empowerment of children in the process of developing self-management skills and independence and that is very important before puberty starts and the parents take first steps of allowing their children independence 
we evaluate each seminar and, where necessary, make changes for the next one. Six weeks after the weekend, both the parents and the children receive a questionnaire. They are asked to give feedback on how the seminar was for them, whether their medical uh, questions were answered, whether their attitude towards the process of bowel management has changed, and whether they have gained more independence. Here on the slide you can see, for example, the reviews of one seminar. Four people said reduction of the time on the toilet. toilet. Two, change, change in the continent situation. Four, change in the medical device. Four said child has become more independent. I would like to finish my presentation with some quotes from parents in their evalu evaluation. When I think back on the seminar, I think about lots of encouragement and being more relaxed, valuable tips, we are no longer alone, happy and relaxed children who openly address subjects that are otherwise taboo, a feeling of security, community and closeness, although we have only known each other for a few hours. In, in conclusion, in self-management seminars, children learn about the malformation they were born with and how to do animus themselves, which can lead to a much greater quality of life. They are encouraged to manage their own bodies and meet other children and adults who are in a similar situation. The seminars also encourage parents to support their children in becoming independent. I hope I've been able to communicate to you the importance of our seminars. If you are interested to organize such a seminar in your country, please do not hesitate to contact us. We would be delighted to share our experiences with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And that's it. Um... Stephanie, if you put your camera on now. There you are. Hello. Um, so thank you both. Um, so I'm going to ask people now if they've got any questions, please send them through. I know we've had a few through so already, which I've sent on to you, Stephanie. I don't know if you can see them or not. So we look on the right hand side in the grey bars. You see one saying questions. I try to read them, but I honestly I have. So if you, ah, if you okay, if you now, uh, bigger, I can see one uh, question. Do you have experience in severe idiopathic constipation? So, yes, for sure. Uh, I haven't included those cases of severe idiopathic constipation into the presentation because this one, because it's part of uh, Eurogene, should um, focus on uh, malformations. But for sure, we also uh, did hydrosonography in idiopathic constipation and uh, we used washouts in some children. And uh, I can uh, only recommend to try it. It's more time consuming from my experience to teach uh, washouts to children with idiopathic constipation than to children with malformations. But uh, I think it's, it's worth trying. Uh, and uh, we've been successful in, in many cases. Okay, so yeah, Stephanie, I think if you, on that grey bar, there's a little arrow to the right hand side. If you click yeah. that, you can make the box a little bigger. Uh, then I have a question. Thank you. I had a, a semantic question. Do you make any difference between incontinence in, and soiling in Hirschsprung's disease? I always consider that there is no incontinence in Hirschsprung's unless repeated perineal surgery. Yes, for sure, most uh, children in Hirschsprung's disease, they are not incontinent in the sense of not being or should not be incontinent in a way of not being capable of controlling uh, uh, the stool, holding the stool. But I think if we are critical of what we see, um, what is continence? Perfect continence, and that's why I showed the slide in the beginning. Perfect continence means that you never think about your uh, uh, about your stool evacuation. 
And if we consider Hirschsprung's kids in this light, we honestly have to say that we will not achieve this goal in all the patients. So um, I think even if they, uh, if the continence organ is working in the Hirschsprung kit, it has a, a kind of incontinence because when it's a constipated child, it's also not a perfect continence that you can achieve. So uh, I do see that there is a difference and um, we do address Hirschsprung kids differently because many kids have this kind of an outlet obstruction and they need sometimes a longer training program until they learn to relax and um, defecate. So that's why sometimes we start the first washouts with the help of a Foley catheter. We insert the water and uh, we help the child uh, and drain the water out in the beginning. But they do learn um, to defecate in a quite short time if you do this training program with them, with the Hirschsprung kids. So was there another question? There are a few more there. So the first one I think you might have not seen, how much time do you keep the enema inside the colon? Um, that's one of the things that's really fun about uh, hydrosonography because you can really see when do, does peristalsis start. And uh, our philosophy is that the enema is not used to soften the stool, but the enema is used to create peristalsis. So uh, when you insert the water, you, um, you have pressure on the colonic wall. And what you can see is the reaction of the colon to this pressure. So in the very moment the patient feels the need to defecate, um, we allow the children uh, to defecate. So we don't believe in um, a time that should, you should keep the water in to soften the stool. Because what we learned from our patients is time saving measures are important. Children don't want to sit on a toilet for 15 minutes and keep the water in. So what we do, we, we insert the water rather quickly and the very moment the child feels the urge to defecate, it's allowed to do so. And what we learn from our patients is that we could really reduce the time um, with this measurement and um, with these measures and our children that we have on the seminars, we usually make so, a, sort of a list who is quickest. And uh, at the moment, uh, it's a boy who needs 12 minutes for his whole washout. And that includes washing his, um, uh, his genitals and, and his anus after defecation. So the whole management process would take him 12 minutes. So we don't believe that it's important um, to soften the stool with the water. It's important to um, introduce, the, to, to get peristalsis working. Could you help me with the questions, Darren, please? Yes, of course. I think another one was, um, Steph, so for you, Stephanie, do you perform the hydrocolonic ultrasound with an empty colon or, or before to clean it? Always with an empty colon. Uh, I think this is decisive. If you do the first washout or the first sonography and insert water into a full colon, the child will hate it. It's a horrible feeling. Uh, just last week, I had a boy who came here for hydrosonography. He brought his uh, peristian system with him and I uh, inserted the catheter and wanted to start the sonography and he said it hurts. And um, well, then we looked at him very closely and we asked him whether he did the medication that he should have had for preparation of his colon and he certainly did not drink it. And, and then he said, oh, please, I've waited for this appointment for so long. Please do just try to insert the water. So I just did a few uh, pump uh, heaps and then he said, no, I can't tolerate this. So uh, from our experience, it's immensely important to make, the, to really empty the colon like you, you're planning endoscopy. So the colon should be as clean as for endoscopy. And you will see everybody, anybody who's cheated because the sonography shows you very easily whether he's cheated or not. Okay, so there's another question, which is, um, 
Thank you for the presentation. My question is, are there any modifications to the procedure uh, for hypo versus hyper motile colon post HD surgery? Does that make sense to you? Yes, that makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the children with the hypermotile colon, that's usually children that have been constipated for a very long time. They had, have this kind of outlet obstruction, which is one of the major issues of Hirschsprung's kids. So what we do in the beginning is that we we help them, what I said before, we try to help them with the, the catheter as a sort of a drainage. So we try to do this orthogradic washout with polyethylene gluc glucol or macrogol. And then when we start the first um, washout, anal rectal washout, and we notice that the child cannot relax, cannot let the water out, then we use the Foley catheter and use it as a sort of a drainage. And that's, that helps the children. And after some time, um, which can be three months, with, which can be six months, then we make a new try and we see whether the colon starts to react because the colon gets slimmer over time. It's not true that a colon that has been dilated never gets back to a slim colon. I always compare it, being a mother of three, I always say, see, after a pregnancy, um, you expect your tummy to go back like this. It does not. It takes a time for your uterus to contract, for your abdomen to get slim again, but it does get slim again. And uh, the colon of a child also gets slim again if you um, consequently treat it. Okay, um, there's another question, uh, three more questions actually. Who performs the ultras, uh, ultrasonography, a surgeon or radiologist? Well, um, we, sometimes the radiologists, um, but uh, it's a very easy method and it really is fun. So I've taught it, it's, it's sort of my method and um, I taught it to our young assistants and many of our young assistants can do it now because that there really is no big deal about it because you can see the colon better than you've ever done in your whole life because there is no air in the colon. You fill the colon with water and that's, that makes the colon lovely for sonography because water is the friend of sonography, air is sort of the enemy. And uh, usually the colon uh, has a lot of air inside. So what we do with our um, clean Clean up, orthogradic clean up before the sonography, we have the best preparation and you can easily see. It. So it's an easy method, just try. You don't need many skills. You, you need a bit of patience in the beginning. You need uh, a room uh, adjacent to a toilet because um, the children will, after some time, certainly need the toilet. So um, you just have to have your facilities ready but uh, it's very easy. And if you have a radiologist who's interested, for sure, um, your radiologist can do it as well. But ours are usually saying, oh, we don't want to do it and we don't have a toilet um, at our hands. So well, anybody can, should try and do it. Okay, um, there's a question from Mohamed Bahadar. It's got two questions, actually. I'll tell you them both now. Um, so it's which position is perfect for the patient when performing fleet enema and what is better to use for washout, cold or warm saline? Well, um, I don't use fleet enemas at all because uh, fleet is not helpful in neither in Hirschsprung's kids nor in, uh, in rectal malformations. Fleet can be dangerous. We do our washouts with simple tap water. We don't even uh, put uh, salt into the water. In the beginning, I followed the general advice and said, oh, I put uh, salt in and we make a saline solution, 0.9%. We've changed that some 10 years ago because um, we learned from our patients and from our experience, it's, it's not necessary to use uh, saline water and it's a lot easier and more effective if you use tap water. In Germany, tap water everywhere in Germany has drinking qualities, so uh, it's no 
effort to use tap water, it's a lot easier. And for sure, you should not use cold water. If you use cold water, this causes cramps in the colon and it makes uh, abdominal pain. So uh, we use tap water in a normal temperature of 35, 36, or even 37 degrees. You shouldn't use too hot water because you can burn the mucosa, which we, we don't want. So better use a, a normal warm water like 37 degrees or a little less. Okay, uh, there's one other question. Um, how do you determine the concentration of the enema? Do you repeat the procedure with a different concentration enema or base it only on the symptoms of the patient? Well, um, we first clean the whole colon, then we do the hydrosonography, and our aim is to uh, introduce su uh, such an amount of water that we can clean the whole colon with one washout. We not always achieve this goal, but if we achieve this goal, then um, you do this one washout and all only with tap water. So you push the water in, you let the water out, and then you should have cleaned the most relevant parts of the colon. We don't put soap in, we don't put fleet in, we don't put glycerin in, we just use the as we hope, right amount of the volume for this individual patient. And it's much easier than to have all these mixtures. Um, I think tap water really, it has to be the right amount. And you have to subtract some 100 to 200 milliliters from the volume you measure from an empty colon. So if you do um, the hydrocolonic sonography and uh, after inserting some 600 milliliters, you see the cecum, then your advice should be do the washout with 400 milliliters. I hope that's understandable. Um, okay, yeah, so I think, oh, so some more questions just come through. So I was going to say, if anybody has any more questions, please send them through now because we are uh, coming up uh, not too far from uh, seven o'clock uh, in Central European time. Um, uh, so I just got the ones here. Um, so we've got a follow -up, follow up question about the um, using the tap water. Even in, a, even in a patient with enterocolitis, can I use normal water? So I said that correctly, um, hopefully. <laughs> If a patient has um, enterocolitis, I would definitely not use um, the peristine system in the first uh, in in the acute phase. In the acute phase of enterocolitis, we do washouts with tap water, or if we are worried, we use Ringer solution, and uh, we do the washouts with a Foley catheter and a syringe because we want to be as careful as possible. Um, we see very few cases of enterocolitis in our Hirschsprung's kids. And this may be um, the result of our, well, easy way of doing washouts. If a child has constipation, we rather recommend to do washouts to the parents and they all get probiotics. And um, we are just working on, on, on the data of our Hirschsprung's kids and we'll publish that within the next half year um, because we really think that um, the high frequency of washouts, we, the step to do a washout is very low in our hospital. So um, yeah, I would do a washout in an enterocolitis, everything that can prevent you from sewing a colostomy or a, would be uh, welcome. So we would try to do the washout with a Foley with a bladder catheter and um, with a syringe. Okay, um, moving quickly on. Um, so it might be for both of you this one, I think. Um, from your experience with six to 12 year olds, do you think these children require a special school? No, I think if they are, uh, on the other hand, I think we're both convinced, Annette, I think I can speak for you. <laughs> they, don't, they, should, they should go to a absolutely regular school. Yeah. We can teach them to do their washouts 
And at the age of 12, after attending one of the SOMA seminars, they uh, will be capable of doing the washouts themselves and they should attend a normal school. And also at the age of six and seven, if the parents do the animals and uh, they are socially clean, uh, they shouldn't uh, go to a special school. No, at all. <laughs> Okay, um, so next question, uh, Dr. Lemley, thanks for the seminar. What do you think is better, to organise a group of patients with different diseases to explain the bowel management or to separate, separate into different groups depending on the etiology? Annette, what do you think? Uh, you mean um, to, 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 to share, to, 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 share the, uh, to, to use only ARM and HD or how is it uh, meant? Uh, yeah, I think that's the question, whether you should, you know, have only ARM children yeah. or only HD. No, it, it, it is possible to mix it because uh, both uh, have similar problems and the the animals are also similar. And we have experience that it's uh, not a problem to, to mix them and uh, they have both an understanding for the others. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think one more question here. It's, um... So, so thank you for your great presentations. Um, what is the largest volume of enema you have used on a patient? I have performed hydrocolonic enemas where patients need two litres of water in order to reach uh, cecum. Have you encountered this too? Um, I, I, as I do the hydrosonography also in adults, I have done large volumes of up to two litres in some patients. So. Um, I think the good thing about sonography is that you can control what you're doing and uh, you have to rely on what the patient says. If he says it's, it, it's hurting, then uh, you better stop inserting the water. Uh, what was the second part of the question? The one was uh, how large the largest enema was and I would say that's some two liters. And what was the second part, Darren? I think that was what was the question. That was the question. What is the largest okay. volume used and they performed they themselves have used two liters. I said, have you yeah. yet? Have you encountered it that as well? So yes, I yeah. think you've answered that. Great, thank you. Uh, and sometimes, if you do, uh, if you have patients with an ACE, uh, undergrad continence, uh, or the, so with a Malone, and you want to do an undergrad continence enema, you can also do that uh, with a control of sonography, and that's quite helpful because sometimes. Uh, if you do, if you go through the appendix, um, you have an influx into the small bowel. I just had that last week with a young woman, and uh, she always complained that uh, her washouts would, wouldn't, her orthographic washouts wouldn't work. And I could see why, because a large amount of the water she instilled, instilled first went into the small bowel, then it took some 15 minutes, and then it just went over into the large bowel. So for her, that was um, quite uh, interesting to see and for me too. Okay, I think one more question at the moment. Um, do you repeat the hydrocolonic sonography during whilst the child is growing up, for example, every four years? Well, if, if everything works well, I would say why control it? Um, if parents want it, Yes, for sure, you can always do it. Um, for me, it's a bit a problem of, of, of time. We have so many new patients that come that um, we sometimes rather take the new ones and do not control the, the long-standing patients with sonography. But I think it's interesting, and I think if you have the time and the opportunity, do it. You will learn a lot and you will probably see um, how the colon gets slimmer with time and you can really see your success and I think it's nice for the patient if he has the, the possibility to see that the effort he's taking really leads to something. Okay, I think that's everything we've got for now. So, um, oh, one more coming quickly. Can you use fluoroscopy for washout of the colon? What? Excuse me, I use, didn't understand that. Oh, sorry. Can you use fluoroscopy for washout colon, of washout of the colon? Does that make sense? Um, is fluoroscopy is is with radiation? 
that's just sorry, a follow-up I'm, question. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I think if Mohammed, if you can clarify that, no, you we, want to clarify we, that at all. We usually just take water, and we do try to avoid um, radiation as much as as possible. There may be situations where we um, use fluoroscopy, but it wouldn't be to uh, to um, establish a bowel management program. We've uh, we've never followed that concept because in Germany restrictions for radiation are very strict and I think it's right and all the children have had so many radiographs in their lives that uh, we should really avoid um, radiation wherever, wherever possible and with this method you really don't need it, need to do a fluoroscopy I think. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, it's now uh, seven o'clock, I think. So, um, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. If you have any follow-up questions you think of, please, you, can, you have my details, send them through to me. Uh, any other questions or anything you want to say? Um, uh, I would say you'll get a survey, those who have attended today, you'll get a survey tomorrow around um, six o'clock, I think, uh, Central European time. Um, if you could fill that in, that'd be great for us to help us carry on improving and give us feedback. On today's session and all our sessions um the video is the this webinar has been recorded and we'll I'll send out the links tomorrow to everyone um you can find it on our go to webinar platform and on our youtube channel where you can find all our other webinars as well on the playlist um most of all say thank you to both stephanie and anetta for doing the presentation today really good an excellent question and answer session as well so thank you very much um, and yeah, uh, please also check our website for future webinars, everybody as well. Um, we've got a little bit of a break coming up after one in July. We, we will be coming back in after September after that, but we'll have details of those. Uh, we'll be putting those on, some of them are on there now, I think already, but we'll put them on in the near future as well. So yes, thank you both again, the presenters uh, for doing that. And if you've got anything else you want us to add at the end, please let me know, or otherwise we can, <laughs> we can finish. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to invite anybody who has a question on, on sonography and our bowel management program. Be happy. I, I'll, I'll be happy uh, to answer your questions. Just send me an email. And um, yeah, so uh, don't hesitate to ask. I just want to stress how important it is for the children to become independent from their from their parents. I know it from my own experience because my son is 27 now and he participated in the very first seminar uh, which we had in 2006. And I hope uh, that in a lot of countries this could be a role model also to exercise these seminars. If you have any questions, please contact us. Yes, thank you. So I so said you can contact, come through me for any questions, and also will all the all the website details will be on the descriptions uh, under certainly on the YouTube channel. You can find all the links there um, from tomorrow, um, and I can provide them as well if you email me as well. So um, yeah, thank you everyone, and thank you for a great webinar, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>